Games Now is an open lecture series on the hot topics of game industry run by Alta University. In order to take the full advantage of the lecture series, make sure that you follow and subscribe our YouTube and Facebook uh, pages and channels. Many of us have very little challenges in playing the games that we love on the conventional computers and consoles. But what if uh, you would have some problems on your eyesight or hearing or other mental or physical barriers for play? Today we learn from accessibility experts, Ian Hamilton and Felicia Prehn, on this topic. So welcome to the stage, Ian Hamilton. Hello. Um, I need to test yet. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. So, um, yeah, my name is Ian, and I am an accessibility specialist. My background before that was in uh, design and UX and in games for children. Now I work solely on accessibility, so working in all different kinds of areas of the industry to try and educate and raise the bar for inclusion of people with disabilities in games. So today I've got a few different areas to cover. I'm first going to... Um, explain a little bit about what accessibility is and why it's important. I'm going to give you a few examples of the kind of things you can consider. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, basically a news update to talk through some of the interesting things that have been happening over the past year. So I'm going to start off with a little bit about what accessibility is. Um, but to explain about what accessibility is, I first need to explain a little bit about what disability itself actually is. And I have this chap here to help me. So this, this photo was taken as part of a uh, newspaper article that he was doing for a newspaper in the UK. Um, and um, when you look at this picture, I'm sure that most of the people in the room could have some kind of a guess at what this guy's disability is, what it is that's making him disabled. So you might be guessing that perhaps he has cerebral palsy. Um, in which case, you've guessed correct in that he does have cerebral palsy, but cerebral palsy is not actually a disability. It's a medical condition, and that's a very, very important distinction to make. So what else? You might be thinking about the fact that he's in a wheelchair. Um, but again, a wheelchair is not a disability either. It's just like a pair of glasses. It's a piece of assistive technology that actually helps him go about his day. And he was going about his day fine until he went to meet his friends in this bar and encountered the steps. And that's what disability actually is. It's a mismatched interaction between a person's impairment encountering some kind of a barrier resulting in difficulty performing a day-to-day -day task. And these kind of barriers, whether it is a flight of stairs or a shelf that's too high or the choice of red and green as team colors for a death match, these kind of barriers are often put there by another person you know, by a designer. So that's kind of a bit of a heavy thing to get your head around that as designers, as developers, as content producers, we actually contribute towards people being disabled. But there is the flip side to that as well, which is that by being aware of the kind of barriers that people can encounter, we can actually work to remove or prevent those kind of barriers and actually reduce disability from happening. And it's that process, that avoidance and removal of barriers, that's known as accessibility. And accessibility is important for all kinds of reasons, um, but I'm just going to talk about two particularly important ones. The first one being the human benefit. And I've got this story here to help. So this, what you're looking at is what's known as an accessibility switch. So this is technology that's used by people who can't operate any kind of traditional input device, like a touchscreen, a mouse, a keyboard. And um, they can form um, all different kind of shapes and sizes. So this example is a button. It might be a pad on a wheelchair headrest, a tube to blow into, a micro switch on your forehead, all these different kinds of devices. But they all work in the same way. It's a simple on-off signal. So that's why they're known as switches. It's exactly the same kind of technology that Stephen Hawking used to use. So we were working on children's games at the time. Um, it was in conjunction with a kids' TV show that was uh, about um, development of language in um, low-functioning autistic preschool kids. 
but also was up on accessibility and representation of all kinds of disabilities. Um, the games we were working on to, to accompany the TV series had to kind of supplement and support the work that the TV show did. So it had to be accessible to, to, pe to, people of, to kids of all kinds of abilities, including kids using this kind of technology. So it got to the stage of the project where we were um, going into uh, children's homes and into schools um, doing our testing. And we made a bit of a rookie error. Um, in the recruitment profile, we said that we were looking for children who had this kind of technology. Um, what we should really have said was children who use this kind of technology. Because we actually ended up in one home where a kid had this kind of setup, but they couldn't use it. So they had um, quite profound um, motor impairment. Um, so just the effort of using a button like this was really difficult and really painful. Um, they also had really profound learning disabilities as well. So this child's parents couldn't actually even explain to their child why they should have to go through that, that experience of trying to do it. Um, the reason that they got on this equipment was in the hope that someday they would be able to operate something like this. So this is a um, communications grid. So basically this, I'm not sure if you can see from that distance, but you see that one of them has got a green outline around it. Basically, this bank of words, that highlight moves every couple of seconds between each word in the grid. And no matter what kind of tiny movement you can do, you just make that movement at the right time and it will choose the word. And then cycles through again, you can choose another word and you can build up sentences. Once you finish your sentence, you hit go and it speaks it out through synthesized speech. So this is like a kid's version of it, but it is, is exactly the same technology that um, Stephen Hawking used to communicate. Um, but anyway, that was the goal. They couldn't do it though. Um, so, so obviously the, the testing wasn't gonna be much good. Um, but the parents knew that this child um, liked the TV show that went with the games we were testing. So they said, you know, even, even, even though our child obviously can't play your game, you may as well just show it to them as you're here. They might get something from the experience. So basically what happened was um, the father of the child um, put the child on their lap and um, put the button on the table, put the child's hand on top, and the father's hand on top, and the father just played the game for the child. But then, as the game progressed, the father said, look at that, and the child was just starting to stretch out their fingers in an attempt to press the button. And the child had never done anything like that before. And obviously, because of things like this, um, other technology that's coming, uh, coming about now, like you can use this, these kind of interfaces to control all kinds of smart devices in your home and all that kind of stuff. By the time that kid's growing up, it, the technology moved on again. So just that, that simple act of starting to stretch out their fingers was going to have a really profound impact on the lives of that child and on the, on the child's family. Not just being able to have a conversation with their family for the first time, but being able to live a much more independent and meaningful life. And the reason why this succeeded where everything else had failed was simply because it was a game. So there was no longer any need for the parents to try to explain to their child why they should have to try and push this button. They just wanted to play with the character on the screen. So it's no exaggeration at all to say that games can really um, profoundly change people's lives. And it doesn't have to be this kind of like niche stuff for small audiences either. Any game at all can have that kind of power. Because what games really represent is access to recreation, to culture, to socializing, which is things that a lot of us take for granted. But if for any reason your means of accessing those things in day-to-day -day life is restricted, then games can all of a sudden become a really powerful contributor to people's quality of life. So that's the first reason, the human benefit. Um, the second reason is a bit more mercenary. It's money. Because people with disabilities are a market. I'm not a small one either. The um, official government statistics are usually around 20% of the population. Now, not everyone within that 20% of the population experiences barriers playing games. But on the other hand, there are conditions that aren't included within that 20%, and they are really, really common. Things like color blindness that affects 8% of males. Difficulty reading, that's one that you hardly ever hear about because there's such a stigma. People don't discuss it. But that's actually around 14% of adults in the UK and the USA have difficulty reading. So whichever way you look at the statistics, there's um, big numbers of people. Um, 
which obviously equates to a lot of money to be made from reaching those audiences, and also a lot of money to be lost by not reaching those audiences. And um, the reason I've got Candy Crush up on the screen is as an example of that. So what you're looking at at the moment is the, the early stages of Candy Crush. And this is a perfect textbook example of the way that you should design for colorblindness. Because you can see, although the pieces of candy are separated by color, they're also separated by shape and pattern as well. So no matter what kind of color perception you've got, you can still tell them all apart. And then the bombs are introduced. So you can see here the bombs now are differentiated only by color. Now I'm going to show you what this looks like with a common form of color blindness. So if you just keep an eye on the green, the orange, and the red bombs at the bottom. So that's it. Game over. You just can't play anymore. And over a really, really trivial design decision as well. Um, and like I said, 8% of males have, so have some form of color blindness. Um, and the point in which they, they introduce the bombs isn't too far from the famous river point where it changes from a game of skill into a game of chance when they start monetizing their games. And it's a particular issue with games like Candy Crush where you have a retention-based business model. So you're relying on keeping players playing for a long time and making those repeat purchases. If one of those players is somebody who's colorblind, that's the entire revenue stream you just cut off. And when this stuff was going on, um, Candy Crush was pulling in hundreds of millions of dollars per quarter so that is just a staggering amount of money that they have potentially left on the table over a really, really small design decision. And it's not just about the um, specific demographics of people with the conditions as well. If you actually design for a niche, this is, these examples are taken from the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit, by the way, which is a nice document. I recommend checking it out. But basically, if you design for physical impairments, such as only having one arm, you are also designing for temporary impairments, like having a broken arm. Um, I'm not recommending you try this yourself, but there is ice outside. This could happen to anyone at any time, you know. It also means you're designing for temporary impairments. So for somebody holding a baby or somebody holding a beer. So this really quickly multiplies out to the benefits, not just being those, those immediate demographics, but also these, this much, much broader group of people who benefit from considerations. And there's also just preference as well. Uh, this is from Uncharted 4. Um, this is actually an example of what I was just talking about with the um, one-handed design considerations. Um, what they've got up here is camera assist and uh, lock on aim. That basically moves the camera around for you and turns the aiming into basically Grand Theft Auto style aiming. So you just point roughly in the right direction, hit lock on, and it aims at them automatically. So if you turn on those two features, um, the game can be played with one hand, just using the left stick and a couple of buttons on the left-hand side. So exactly that kind of consideration I was just talking about. Um, preferences. Um, I actually had a nice example of uh, someone who actually worked for PlayStation who would use different assists at different times. So like at the weekends when he had a few hours to kill, he would want to uh, sit down and really, really like knuckle down at a big challenge. He'd turn all the assists off. When he just got home from work, like on a Wednesday, he had half an hour free after a busy day before dinner. He just wanted to relax. He would put on those one-handed assists and play with them just so he could have a bit of, bit of a relaxing time with the game. So as a result, they, they checked the um, usage data. They actually tracked the usage data on this. And in quite a rare move for a big studio, they shared it publicly. So for people like him who are using the features through preference, through people with uh, situational impairment, through people with temporary impairments, through people with permanent impairments. Um, designing for the permanent impairments, there's just under 1% of the population who only want, have one hand. But due to all these other groups, these assists were actually used by a third of Uncharted's players. So that's millions of Uncharted before players using these features. So that's the two main reasons, the, the, the kind of the, the market argument and also the, the human benefit to the players. But I am just going to quickly, quickly mention one other reason why thinking about accessibility is important, and that is a selfish one. So I'm going to ask 
for some audience interaction for this one. It's not going to be too painful, though, I promise. So I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. So I'd like you to raise your hand if you are thinking about giving up gaming by the time you reach the age of 65. So no takers. Good. I told you it wouldn't be too painful. So the reason that I'm mentioning this is because, you know, I mentioned like that 20% stat earlier. Um, once you get over the age of 65, that's actually 50%. So it really does come for us all. So that's a really important reason to be thinking about this, that if we want to be playing games as we get older, we need to be thinking about this stuff now, get those good practices in place. Um, I saw a discussion about this on Reddit. Um, it went kind of how Reddit discussions usually do, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, someone replying to that saying, actually, you know what, I don't think I will want to play a game some 65. I think I'm just going to be sat there in my rocking chair watching my grandkids playing. And I saw a really nice reply to them, which was actually, you know, when I get to that age and I'm sat there watching my grandkids playing, I would rather be playing with them. So that's a little bit now about um, what accessibility is, um, why accessibility matters, which is all well and good, but what do you do about it? It can seem quite an intimidating thing, because it's hard enough trying to design a game that you like, let alone thinking about like casual and core, and like how would you even begin to design for something like this? But the thing is, you don't have to, because if you think back to the guy in the wheelchair at the start, this isn't, this, all this is is actually a list of medical conditions, and it's not the medical conditions that are important. What's important is the barriers that people encounter. So if you take, for example, um, something like uh, dyspraxia, something like essential tremor, like you're talking about things, the medical conditions, that have nothing in common with each other medically, um, but they both encounter the same issue of small, fiddly interface elements. And if you address them, you're also addressing a whole bunch of visual conditions as well. So once you start to think about the barriers and the kind of like shared barriers that different groups of people encounter, it actually becomes a lot simpler. And there's only really four, maybe five broad groups of impairments. So that's people who encounter barriers relating to their sight, their hearing, cognition, which is the ability to take in process and action information, and motor, which in games is generally about the ability to manipulate a controller. There's also speech as well. Um, speech isn't generally too much of an issue in games unless you get into online multiplayer. That's where speech becomes a consideration. And the way that you address barriers relating to all of these groups is generally through the same two basic principles. The vast majority of accessibility issues can be addressed either by communicating information in more than one way. It's like the Candy Crush example, using shapes and patterns as well as color like subtitles, offering text as well as audio. And the other one, just giving players some flexibility. So like in Uncharted 4, giving people some choice in how they control the game, giving choice of difficulty levels, that kind of stuff, allowing people to tailor the experience a bit to their own particular needs. I could make this talk all about the kind of considerations that you can make, lots of different examples, um, but I want to get onto some of that cool stuff that's been happening as well. So I'm just going to give you a few key examples. Um, the examples that I'm going to give you are the top four most complained about accessibility issues. Um, I have to give a little caveat in that top four most complained about isn't the same as like the top four biggest, because like for example I said about the um, people having difficulty reading, People don't complain about that. There's huge numbers of people encountering barriers, but not talking about them. So it's, it's worth thinking about other things as well. But even if you were just to tackle these four, they're all pretty straightforward, and that would mean huge numbers of people having a much, much more enjoyable experience with your game. The first one relates to vision. And it's color blindness. So, as I mentioned earlier, the best way to address color blindness is to just remove reliance on color from the equation, as they do in Candy Crush, by using something else in conjunction, using pattern, shape, symbol, words, just something else to make sure you're not relying on color alone. This is a similar example, but slightly different. This is a game called Hue, which is a color-based um, 
puzzle platformer, um, they actually have an option that you can turn on and off. So you can see here they've basically developed a symbol language that equates to each of the different colors. There's just a toggle to turn that on and off. Another approach you can take, um, these, this, this kind of approach doesn't work for all games, and you don't always have the luxury. So for example, if you're playing a, uh, a death match, you don't have the luxury of like, designing each team to be completely differently. That could be quite expensive. Um, there are other techniques you can use. The, te the technique that colorblind gamers request all the time, but they hardly ever get, is just let them choose what the colors are. So this is an example. It does exist sometimes. So you can see here, it's offering players just a free choice. They can choose what color they want each team to be. Really, really simple to implement, but it's really rarely done. Um, what you see more often is something like this. So this is from Destiny, obviously, um, where there are a few different preset combinations of colors which are optimized for some of the common forms of color blindness. Um, this has its limit. So you can only cater for conditions that you know about and can design for up front. Um, there's also various different edge cases. So some people who see only in black and white, um, some people who, through um, trauma, have completely unpredictable effects on the vision, different colors swapped around and stuff. So you can't design modes for everybody. Um, where this does have use is it allows people just to quickly pick an option without having to go through the work of configuring. So ideally, what you want is to combine this with this. See if you can have a few, a few couple of presets for um, conditions that you know about, but also have custom underneath and just let people choose what colors they want as well. The same kind of ways you might do for controls, like, you know, like um, default, bumper jumper, southpaw, custom. And the color blinds, so I'm going to leave you with a tool. Uh, this tool is called Color Oracle. Um, it simulates uh, these three types of color blindness. So it's a really, really handy tool to have. It just sits in your system tray. You click on it, and it just changes the colors of whatever's currently on the screen to simulate color blindness. So that's a really, really effective way to do some checking as you go through. Next up, also relating to vision. And this is complained about so much. And the complaints are getting more and more as developers are more and more often um, assuming that people are playing on massive 60-inch screens, you know, three feet away from you. That isn't the case. I'm sure most of the people in this room don't have a 60-inch TV sat three feet away from them, but that's often the way that games are designed. So the kind of thing I'm talking about is this. And as I said, this is becoming more and more of a problem. Tech sizes are getting smaller and smaller. So this was, I think this was Forza. Mass Effect Andromeda. And this actually, um, I mean, it's only one sale I'm talking about, but this, this cost them one sale at least. Anyway, I personally, I have, I have my vision is fine. I have 2020 vision. Um, I downloaded the demo of Mass Effect Andromeda. And um, I mean, presumably they've made the text that small to try and increase the immersion. But there is nothing, nothing at all less immersive than having to get up off your couch and walk over and peer at the TV to try and figure out what the hell it's saying. Um, so you can see on here, um, see where it says tram console? Yeah. That is, that is your mission objective. That's like the most important text on the screen. And there is also a reminder up at the top right as well. You can see it says activate the tram. So those two, those are the you know, two most important pieces of information there. And so yeah, I, I downloaded the demo. Um, like I said, my vision is fine, but it was just so much, for chore, so much of a chore playing the game that that was it. I played the other Mass Effect games religiously. I absolutely loved them. Um, maybe not the ending of the third game so much, but I loved them. I was really excited about this game, and I didn't buy it because the text, just because of the text, no other reason. There are standards you can work to, and this is something that, that's nice about con Accessibility in the games industry is kind of a bit behind other industries, um, which obviously in some ways isn't so great, but it does have a really good benefit, which is that other industries have already solved a lot of these problems, spent a lot of time researching like standards, guidelines, and stuff that you can just steal them and put them in games. And tech size is a good one. So this kind of stuff, I mean, these, the 
the size for the um, static UI text. I mean, you can look at um, Amazon's, uh, Amazon and Google's guidelines that they've researched for screen-based experiences. Um, you can look at the um, Snellen chart, which is when you have an eye test, the decreasing size of the letters. You basically do that in reverse, and it tells you what kind of size you should be able to see at certain distances. You can look at guidelines for um, what size writing should be on street signs in the motorway, and they all come up with the same kind of size which roughly translate to, if you're developing like a console game at 1080p, then it should be about 32 pixels. The other one, timed limited text, um, that needs to be a bit bigger. Um, if you have only got a few seconds to read a bit of text, you need a bit more time to process it. And that's basically what it looks like on the screen. So that's the kind of sizes you should be aiming for. I'd love to see that. Like, if, if the mission objective in Mass Effect was that size, then I'd have bought it without a second's hesitation. Oh, actually, something else that's worth mentioning on this. Um, you can allow that to be configurable. So different people have different preferences. Some art directors love tiny text, such as some of the examples I showed you. You can let people configure it. It's the kind of thing you need to think about early in development to allow flexible text size, but it can be done. So on a similar note now, hearing. When you think about accessibility for people who have difficulty hearing, the first thing that most people think about is subtitles, which is what I'm going to talk about. Subtitles are really, really commonly used. Um, I've got a specific example of some usage data, which I'm going to say for a bit later on. Um, but they're used for all kinds of reasons. I'm sure there's loads of people in this room who use subtitles when they're playing. People use them if um, your uh, first language isn't the same as the one in the game. People use them because of unpredictable audio mixes in games. You never know when there's going to be a big explosion just in the middle of an important bit of storyline. People use them because they're playing in a noisy room with kids running around shouting. Or because, on a related note, the only chance you get to play is when the baby's asleep. And you need to play on mute to avoid waking the baby up. So loads and loads of people use subtitles, really, really rely on them. So it's really justified to do a good job on them because they can have such a big impact on people's experience. But nobody does. Subtitles in the games industry are terrible, and I do mean in all of your games. And that's not me saying this. this I'm quoting gamers. So um, you get the picture, right? And what people, you can see there's a few examples of the kind of things that people are complaining about, and, and it's really not rocket science. The, the two most commonly complained issues with subtitles are size. There's, there's no photoshopping involved. This is, this is a real screenshot. And contrast. So you can see here you've got the, um, the white text over the light background here. And bear in mind, this was Assassin's Creed 4. Um, Assassin's Creed 3 was set in the snow. So you can see that, that you know, it's not rocket science to sort this kind of stuff out. Um, this is an example of the kind of thing that she'd be, she'd be looking at as a minimum. So you can see here it's using a nice, um, easily readable font. It's very clearly separated from the background. And it's a decent size. Um, that's the kind of thing you should be aiming at as a minimum. Um, I say minimum because actually there's different use cases for subtitles. Um, you've got some people who are completely reliant on them, who have got no hearing at all, who really need to not miss a single word of them. At the other end of the scale, you've got people who, um, who just have them turned on to glance at occasionally if they happen to miss a word and want them to be as subtle and unobtrusive as possible. So actually, every one of these three different approaches, that is actually the preferred choice for one particular group of gamers. So which one do you go for? You don't have to go for any of them. This is a digital medium. You can let people choose for themselves. And this is something that's really, really common. Well, it's standard. It's actually for broadcast video in the USA, actually required by law, that you have to allow the presentation of subtitles to be customized. Um, that doesn't apply to games, it's just for TV. But if like, you open up Netflix, you open up YouTube, you have a look in the settings, and they always let you change what size the text is, whether or not you want that background box. It doesn't really happen in games. It's just starting to now, and I'm going to give you a few more examples later on, but this is one example. So this is from um, Hitman. 
the latest Hitman. And that just allows you to change the size. As you can see there, um, the number 46 at the end, um, that's actually referring back to the, um, the sizes that I was talking earlier, that 46 pixels at 1080p. So that's even though um, some people don't like text that size, um, other people really rely on that. So you can just get, give people the choice. There's tons of other stuff that you can do with subtitles as well, um, all these kind of things. I'm not going to go through all these things now, but if you want to read up on how to do a good job of subtitles or how to make subtitles that don't suck, um, that website address at the top, that goes through all of them in some detail. But even if you just do those two basic things, make sure that your subtitles have decent size, decent contrast, that will actually put you way above a lot of the industry and will make a huge difference to how many people can have an enjoyable experience with your game. So last example, uh, this relates to motor, um, so your ability to operate a controller. So to, to explain what this consideration is, um, I've got another person here to help me out. Um, this is a different chat to the person who made the quote. Um, uh, this guy, he had a stroke at the age of 17, and he lost all ability in the right-hand side of his body. But he had no interest at all in giving up playing games. Um, why would you, right? Um, and he plays fine, um, just using regular controllers still. So if you look a bit closer, basically what he does is um, he puts the controller underneath his right arm. His right arm rests on top of the stick. So by actually moving the whole controller around, that moves the right stick around. He can then use his thumb to control the left stick. That then leaves him a few fingers to try and reach around the controller. There are limits to that. So there's limits to how many kind of buttons he can press at the same time and in what places. What he really needs is to be able to move the most important functions to positions on the controller that you can reach more easily. So he just needs button remapping. And this is a really classy example of a feature that's useful for, for so many people. Um, obvious example being you disagree with the, the interesting choices the designers have made over how the controls in the game work. So it's really, really important for player preference. But for some people, for that smaller group of people, it can actually mean a difference between being able to play or not at all. So it's really, really important. Um, consoles now have actually started doing remapping at system level. But it's really, really important to say that that is just a safety net. It's only there for games that haven't provided it. It's not a substitute. It's way, way better to do it in-game for a whole ton of reasons. Um, for everything from being able to have your instruction prompts um, map. Um, so you actually, when it says press X, you can actually have it update to reflect what the updated controls are. Um, so that you can um, have multiple different mappings within a game. So for example, Overwatch allows you to set up different remapping for each character class. For a game like Grand Theft Auto, when you've got driving and running to be able to map separately. Even just basic usability of people being able to find the options. Because so many people use remapping just out of preference that they're not necessarily going to know to look in the system settings of a console to change them. So there's all kinds of reasons why you should do it in game rather than rely on the system. Um, so much so that um, Bryce Johnson, um, he's the chap who actually designed the remapping functionality on the Xbox. So remapping, really, really important, and a really, really good value feature that benefits tons of people. So that's the only example that I'm going to give you to for today. Um, there's a load of other cool stuff that you can do. Um, so for that, if you check out this website, it's just gameaccessibilityguidelines.com. So it's loads of other examples like these, examples of the kind of barriers that people can face and also solutions to those barriers as well. So next, on to the cool stuff. So this is what I really, really wanted to show with you today, some of the, some of the interesting things that have been happening over the past year because the, the pace of change um, is accelerating more and more every year and there's all kinds of exciting things happening at the moment. Um, it's quite nice to be in a position now where there is too much stuff to be able to cover in the space of a talk. That's a very nice problem to have. So I'm just going to concentrate on a few key themes that I've seen over the past year. So developments in platforms, corporate initiatives, dialogue with gamers, um, some very nice high-level support. Legislation, which is an interesting one that not enough people know about yet. Um, you really need to, and also some cool stuff in games. 
So starting with platforms. I've just chosen two platforms, um, but chosen them for very different reasons. So first off, the um, Xbox. The Xbox is now a couple of years into their accessibility journey. They aren't resting on the laurels. They're still doing more and more cool stuff. So just in the past year, they've done things like upgrading their text-to-speech functionality for blind gamers, upgrading their zoom functionality so you can zoom in on the game, lock the zoom in place and play while zoomed, um, also opening up APIs for developers so you can read settings set at system level for whether a player wants a game to be in high contrast, whether they want large text in their subtitles, pull those preferences in and use them to set defaults in your own game. Um, they have also opened up an API for real-time transcription in between text and speech. So if a player is playing a multiplayer game, um, they can type something in text and have it spoken out to people on the other end. They can also speak and have it translated to text on the other end as well. So someone who's blind and someone who's deaf can communicate barrier-free. It's made its way into its first couple of games now, both Forza 7 and Halo Wars 2 have this in. But it's just an open API. Anyone who's developing using the Xbox SDK can make use of that. They've also added in text-to-speech as well for interfaces. So if you want to make your game accessible to gamers who are blind, um, it just has an API sitting there. You just send it a text string. So like when somebody moves focus in between interface elements in your game, you can just send the text label of that interface element out to this API. It will then speak it out via synthesized speech. So it's really, really easy to make an Xbox game that's blind accessible now. A really, really cool feature, though, is something that's quite different to all of those. It's something called co-pilot mode. And this is the kind of thing that you just think, oh my god, why didn't somebody think of this earlier? It basically allows you to plug in two controllers into the Xbox and have both the controllers do exactly the same things to each other. So why would you want to do that? Well, it opens up all kinds of nice things. So one example being, one that would be nice for me, I remember playing, um, playing the Lego Avengers game um, with my little three-year-old nephew. And he was getting really stuck and frustrated. And I just kept offering him to help. And then eventually he gave up and just his whole just body just slumped. And he just handed the controller over to me to do the difficult boss fight for him. The co-pilot mode, I could have just picked up the second controller and just kind of helped him out a bit. Um, that's one use. Another use, a blind gamer I was talking to recently who makes use of it. So he is completely blind, no sight at all. Um, but he can get enough of an understanding of his, uh, his environment to be able to play Doom um, just the shooting aspect of it. He can hear where a demon is making a noise and turn around and shoot him, but he can't navigate around the level itself. So he has a friend set next, sat next to him. His friend does the walking on one controller, he does the shooting on the other. A bit like in Mario Kart Double Dash, where you have player two shoot the throwing shells. You can do that for any game at all now. But what the feature was really designed for was so that you can have a single person using two controllers. So you can, for example, have the left-hand side of one controller controlled using your left hand, the right-hand side of another controller controlled using your foot. So for example, if you've got only one hand. So and up to this point, if you wanted to do that kind of like split controls in between different parts of your body, you had to pay a lot of money getting a custom controller made. Now you just plug in two standard Xbox controllers and it just works really, really well. So the other one that I want to mention is the Nintendo Switch. Um, that's for a very different reason. Um, the Switch has just started implementing, they're kind of earlier on in their accessibility journey. They've just started including a couple of features aimed at uh, vision. So you can turn the visuals into grayscale and invert the colors, which can be useful if you're having difficulty with some glare on a bright interface. Um, the reason for mentioning them is because the Switch including those features actually means, and I'm normally very careful about claiming that something is the first. That's usually a good way to guarantee that it's not the first, that there's something you weren't aware of. But actually, I am 100% certain about this. This is the first time in the history of the games industry that every major gaming platform, so at the moment I'm talking about Xbox, Switch, PS4, iOS, Android, Windows, every single major gaming platform now has options specifically for people with disabilities. That's never happened at all in the history of the industry. So that's a huge, huge landmark. And on a similar note, I mean, I don't know how many people in the room are actively involved in developing consoles and operating systems, but over the, past, over the space of the last year, um, there was a set of accessibility guidelines launched specifically for people making platforms. So advice on implementing those kind of features um, if you're making an operating system. 
Also in the top of your guidelines, um, the game accessibility guidelines I mentioned earlier, um, they hit their fifth anniversary in September, and they had quite a major content update, including some new functionality. So there's, amongst that, there's now an Excel download that you can use during QA and ideation and all that kind of stuff. Um, next up, I mentioned um, initiatives. Um, so this is kind of big players in the industry um, making some making some quite bold steps in some cases towards supporting accessibility. This is a picture of Global Game Jam. I assume most of the people in the room are familiar with game jams. Um, if not, it's like a gaming hackathon, spending a couple of days uh, developing a game from start to finish. And Global Game Jam is a huge one, taking place all over the world. Many, many tens of thousands of people taking part. And the Entertainment Software Association, which is the industry body in the USA that represents the games industry, all the big players, um, all the Xbox, EA, Nintendo, all those kind of people. Um, they actually sponsored Global Game Jam specifically for accessibility. So they paid to guarantee that there was an accessibility challenge in Global Game Jam. Obviously really, really good for all the people who take part and take it up, but just the simple fact of having that mentioned on the Global Game Jam website in front of all those tens of thousands of people who are looking at that website is a really, really big piece of awareness raising too. PlayStation um, at PSX, which is their annual consumer event, they had a uh, Games with Disabilities reception. Microsoft, uh, this is actually a charity called Warfighter Engage to um, adapt controllers for people with disabilities. Um, this is them up on stage at the Microsoft Gaming and Disability Boot Camp, which is basically an internal one-day conference for all the like, first-party in-house Xbox developers, for them to all learn about accessibility. PlayStation had something similar as well. Um, this is Shuhei Yoshida with uh, Josh Straub, who's quite a well-known accessibility advocate. And they had a similar kind of thing, an internal awareness raising day um, for developers to learn about accessibility and why it's important. This was actually as part of Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which is across all industries in the middle of May. I think it's May the 17th this year. So if you ever wanted an excuse to raise some awareness and um, some examples, like there's other companies like PlayStation, um, like Funker in Sweden, like BBC, who are doing these kind of big events, but loads of other people just tweeting, writing blog posts, just anything at all to let people know that accessibility is something important to you and important to the community in general. So if you want to get involved with that, May the 17th, even if anything as small as just like a little tweet really makes a difference. So these kind of things, these are all kind of temporary like uh, one day initiatives. There's been some permanent stuff as well. Like this, this is the um, Xbox, uh, Inclusive Tech Lab. So this, um, uh, sorry, right, I was just checking something. So the Xbox Inclusive Tech Lab, um, this is a permanent installation at uh, Microsoft HQ. Um, what you're looking at here is people who are using vision impairment simulators. There's a bit of that simulator stuff. They also have just loads of cool tech, loads of cool accessibility toys, like the switch that I was talking about earlier, there for people to come in and play with. Um, so the idea being to help build a bit of understanding and empathy and that kind of stuff. Another nice permanent one, um, Karen Stevens. Um, you might remember her name from earlier, the quote about the number of colorblind people who are playing Madden. This is her. She's actually now been made accessibility lead for EA Sports. So that is her permanent full-time role within the studio, is just thinking about accessibility. And uh, as far as I'm aware, that's the first time that a big studio publisher has had that full-time in-house role. And it's sounding like already that is, is sending some waves, so I think that's gonna be something you'll see a lot more of over the next year or two. And part of her responsibilities is this gathering feedback. Some of it through Twitter. Um, she's actually set up forums as well that hook directly into the bug reporting systems for all the various studios. So there's actually a really clear way for people with disabilities to actually have their voices heard. And um, that's been happening more and more as well. Um, sometimes at a wider level, like Ubisoft having, and Ubisoft and um, Industrial Light and Magic, both doing quite wide scale um, surveys of the, of the disabled gamer communities. Um, also, even at a smaller level, so producers keeping an eye on what people are saying on Twitter, and if they see a piece of accessibility feedback, just jumping in and opening that dialogue. And that's so important. And it's something that no matter how big or small you are, you know, you don't need to be 
like in EA. Um, just that little thing of just having a chat with somebody on Twitter can make a big, big difference. And all these kind of initiatives, whether um, it's stuff like Karen, whether it's these like big events, things like the Inclusive Tech Lab, none of these would be possible without support from the top within these companies. And that's something that's changed a lot in the past couple of years. So previously, it was often the case of individual, individual developers trying to fight against the system to get things done. That's really rapidly changing. And they're talking about it publicly. So you can see this from Mike Ybarra, Corporate VP of Gaming. Phil Spencer, head of Xbox. here again from Sony. Um, this kind of stuff is so, so important because if you're going to have like lasting cultural change, the pressure needs to come from different levels. You need people on the ground who understand what needs to be done and want to do it. You need external pressure from the gaming community, people saying, this, is matter this matters to me, I need to see this happen. But you also need support from the top, from people in management and director positions who also care and are willing to actually empower their staff to make these changes, to help those features make their way up the backlogs. And I've got one more quote for you, um, this one. So from Kim Kardashian. Now the Kim Kardashian game, um, that makes a ton of money. And this is actually a fundraiser for a charity in the UK called Special Effect to adapt controls for people with disabilities. So just that thing itself of, of that, that um, day's revenue going towards that charity is, is a great thing in itself. But the reason why I've got this quote up is because it's Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian is one of the top 10 most followed people on Twitter. So just those two words there, getting the words disabled gamers in front of her audience of 60 million followers is a huge deal. That's an, a staggering amount of awareness raising. And that kind of broad scale awareness raising has been happening in the media as well. So this is an article in The Economist talking about the business case for accessibility. BBC News, this is a story they ran on blind accessibility. Another nice quote there from Phil Spencer, head of Xbox. We want to make sure games and consoles we build are accessible to any kind of player. And I really can't understate <coughs> the importance of this kind of big scale awareness raising work. Because it's this kind of stuff that not only drives awareness of and acceptance of accessibility, but also of disability of disabled gamers in general. So next, a bit of a change of pace, I'm gonna talk about legislation. So what this picture is, is a photo of Obama signing in a piece of legislation in 2010 called CVAA, which is the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, snappy name. So this has two aspects to it. One is broadcast video, the kind of stuff I was talking earlier about like Netflix and YouTube having customization options for subtitles. That doesn't apply to games. What does apply to games is the communication aspect. So if you have like uh, team chat, that kind of stuff in a game, that's actually covered by legal accessibility requirements. Presuming you want to release your game in the USA, which most people do. So the, um, because the, the primary purpose of games isn't communication, the games industry was actually granted a number of waivers to allow some R&D time and figure out how this kind of fits in with game development. Um, in December, just gone, um, the final waiver was granted. So there is now a compliance deadline set. So any game launching after the 1st of January 2019 must meet a basic set of accessibility requirements. Um, most of it is fairly straightforward, making sure you've got decent contrast, you've got remappable controls. Um, those meet some of the requirements. Um, the two worth pointing out are that the communications functionality and the means of navigating to it must be accessible to people who are blind with no vision at all. So that means the kind of thing I was talking about earlier, like the Xbox text-to-speech API. Um, also, depending on what kind of communication you have in your game, um, if you're reliant on very quick instant messaging with people you haven't met before, that could potentially mean that you need to have that kind of real-time transcription that I was mentioning earlier. So again, that API that's available on the Xbox. 
And I would expect and hope that, that as the compliance deadline approaches, there'll be more tools available like that on other platforms that you can use as well. And there's another one coming now as well, a bit further down the line, the EU Accessibility Act. Um, this is a piece of legislation that's aimed at standardizing um, all the various different kinds of accessibility laws there are across Europe into one single set of legislation. The idea being to make, um, make people's jobs easier. You only have one single target to aim for. And again, this, this applies to communications in the same way that CVAA does, but it also applies to e-commerce. So if you have microtransactions in your game, that will also have to meet a set of accessibility requirements. This legislation is quite early on. They've, they've just agreed their basic approach. They'll spend the next year trying to get it turned into a law. After that, there'll be another, as with CVA, like another lengthy waiver process. So it's probably not going to be until like five years' time that this kind of stuff hits, but it's nice to be able to have a bit of an advance warning that this kind of stuff is coming. So legislation is a bit of a heavy topic. Um, I'm going to lighten things up again now by finishing up on a bit of talk about games. So there's been um, a lot of examples of games in the past year that are going back in and patching accessibility into existing titles. So like Overwatch have now ex started experimenting with captioning for people who are deaf for things like um, when players are shouting out they're about to do an ultimate. Madden, this is a really cool one. So Madden, the entire gameplay of Madden 18 is completely accessible to people who are blind, who have no vision at all. And they've done that through haptics. So a lot of the gameplay is already described because you have a commentator already telling you what plays are happening and what's going on. And they basically added vibration cues to the kind of interface stuff that happens in the game. So for example, when the kick meter is on the screen, the controller vibrates up and down in time with the meter going up and down. And normally when you do blind accessibility, um, it's usually done through audio. Um, but the person who put this stuff into place was actually hard of hearing herself. So she can't test audio cues, so she went for haptics instead. But it's actually worked really nicely. There's a lot of blind gamers who are having a lot of fun with Madden now. Vaporum, this was nice. Vaporum basically implemented a super hot mode. So you turn on the setting, and then it makes the game work in the same way as super hot, in that when you stop moving, the rest of the game stops moving as well. So at any point at all, all you need to do is just take your hands off the controls, and everything stops, and you get a bit of a gap whether that might be you need a bit of more time to physically coordinate yourself, um, whether you have um, cognitive issues that mean you need a bit more time to kind of plan what you're going to do. At any time, you can just stop and take a little bit of extra time over it. Mario Kart, um, when Mario Kart was um, uh, re-released on the Switch, they added in a couple of assists, um, assists with the steering, assists with the acceleration. You can see the example here is um, somebody who had a stroke who was able to play as a result of the assist. Um, I've also seen someone who was uh, legally blind, so somebody who's got very low vision, who was able to play Mario Kart for the first time as well, just because they needed just that extra little bit of assistance. Code 7, and um, this was another game that, was, that had blind accessibility patched in. Um, this was the kind of traditional blind accessibility you see in websites and that kind of stuff, which is using text-to-speech screen readers, because it's a text-based game. So it's a similar kind of principle that I was talking about earlier with the Xbox text-to-speech API, where basically it's just shunting all the text out to a synthesized speech engine. So that's games that have had accessibility patched in. What's been really nice to see is games that aren't patching accessibility in, games that are thinking about accessibility from the very start. And that's when you can do some really nice stuff. Um, a classic example of that being um, text size that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Witcher 3, when that came out, they went back in and patched in bigger text after complaints from players. Um, that would have been really difficult, really expensive, and they were quite limited in what they were able to do. But if you think about text size from the start of development, like I said, that like 28, 32 pixels, you think about that from the start, it's free. It's just a design decision, right? Deciding I'm not going to use small text. So it really, really opens up possibilities for doing so much more. One example being near. Um, Nier has auto chips that allow you to automate certain areas of gameplay. Really, really nice for accessibility. If there's some aspect of gameplay you have difficulty with, you can turn, choose to turn them on. This is a game called She Remembers Caterpillars, and they have tackled accessibility for colorblindness. 
They can see here this is uh, it's additive. So basically you've got red and you've got blue and you've got purple, which is a combination of red and blue. Um, this kind of mechanic is the kind of thing that a couple of years ago would have just been written off as, you know, this game is just inherently color-based. There's no way that people who are colorblind can ever play it. But all they've done is they've added symbols. And they have an additive symbol language. So in the same way that red and blue add together to make purple, you now have squares and circles, which add together to make a combination of a square and a circle. And you can see it's actually reflected in the body shapes of the caterpillars as well. So it fits really nicely with the aesthetic of the game. It's really nicely integrated. I'm sure you can imagine if you thought about this at the end of the development, there's no way you could do something that's this nicely integrated into the style of the game. Also games um, that are doing a wide range of different accessibility things. Um, this is at one end of the scale, Forza 7, um, doing a whole bunch of nice accessibility stuff for motor and vision. But also the other end of the scale as well. So this is um, a game called Midboss. You can see they do a ton of nice accessibility stuff. In addition to this, they also considered, considered simulation sickness, color blindness. They've done loads of nice stuff. And Midboss was, was, was not like Forza. This wasn't a big AAA game. Midboss was made by one single developer. And simply because they thought about accessibility early in the process, they were able to do a ton of really, really nice stuff and make the game much better for a, for a huge number of players. And subtitles. So um, this is the example I gave to you before of Hitman allowing you to customize the subtitle size. There's been a few other games now which are starting to do some nice accessibility stuff with their subtitles. That customization, personalization I was talking about. This is Assassin's Creed Origins. They've done some work on their subtitles as well. And um, they don't have configurable size, but they did at least choose a decent default. They went with that 46 pixels as their default size. They also allow you to turn speaker names on and off, so it appends the name of the person who's speaking in front of the text. Also, subtitle background. So you remember I showed you that example of the three different, three different use cases for subtitles? Um, so they just allow you to turn that black box behind the subtitles on and off. And actually, I'll give you a list of all of the games that I'm aware of in the history of the industry that have given you that option. Um, Assassin's Creed Origins and Life is Strange. That's the list. And how difficult is that to do, right? And it makes such a difference. So if you really, really want to be at the pinnacle of innovation in the games industry, let people turn that box on and off. That's all it takes. But what makes Assassin's Creed really interesting is that like, much like Uncharted 4 at the beginning, um, they actually collected usage data and shared it publicly, which is a really, really rare thing for a AAA studio to do. And on average, across all their platforms, Xbox, PS4, and PC, 60% of their players play with subtitles turned on. So if you've got a feature like that, that it makes such a difference to so many of your players, it's really, really worth putting in that little bit of extra design effort into it. So lastly, before I finish, I'm going to step a bit outside the games and talk about Star Wars. So the reason I'm going to talk about Star Wars is I actually looked at the um, sales figures for digital, entertain digital entertainment in the UK. And last year, Rogue One sold 1.38 million copies. So that's across DVD, Blu-ray, Netflix, all that kind of stuff. Um, it actually wasn't the top-selling film of the year. The top-selling film of the year was Beauty and the Beast, which sold 1.4 million. But still, 1.38 million copies. Call of Duty, 2.44. FIFA, 2.69. So games are literally bigger than Star Wars. And Star Wars is obviously like a huge cultural phenomenon, right? So are games. So when a big game comes out, when you've got like a Call of Duty coming out, when you've got a Pokemon Go coming out, that's a huge, huge cultural phenomenon. You're bombarded with it in the media. It's what all your friends are talking about. It's what all your friends are doing. So that's the point I want to leave you on, that, um, you know, at the beginning, I talked a bit about like, the human benefit and the business benefit, but there's also the cultural side of it, that games are such a deeply entrenched part of our society and our culture that it's a really, really big deal to be left out and excluded from that. So that is all from me. I'm now going to hand over to Leisha, who's going to tell you a little bit about what it means from someone who is actually living this stuff.
can you hear me? Am I on yet or no? Am I on yet? Okay. Am I? I don't know. Um, I have to tell you something first. Um, I don't have a down key on my keyboard. Oh, brilliant. Um, but if, you use the, if you use the right key instead, that'll be it. Uh, this one, you mean? Uh, this one. This Left bit. Ah, oh, this one. Yep. <laughs> Disability and accessibility in action. Yes. So anyway, hello. My name is Felicia Pren. You can call me Leisha or really anything. I don't care. Um, I work for a studio in Pori called Nopia. Uh, we were an animation studio first, but now we make mobile games too. So a little bit about me. I'm 27, so I'm your typical millennial in that sense. Uh, I'm from America, New York City to be specific, from an Italian-American background. So I talk with my hands about 89% of the time. And now I have to see what else I wrote about myself because I don't remember. Oh yeah, so I've been gaming uh, and playing games since I was about five or six. Our neighbors were moving and they had a Super Nintendo and a regular NES that they were um, gonna just throw away. And my mom was like, no, 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 give them, to, give them to Felicia. So I was able to have my first console about that time. And when I was playing games at that point, I had a tiny CRT television in my bedroom at my, at my dad's house. And that's where I would play um, the regular NES system. Just uh, the first Mario game, a little bit of Duck Hunt, um, in this one MTV uh, trivia game show game that they had made for NES. And that's, uh, that's basically what I was doing for many years until I was able to get a Nintendo 64 for my first communion as a combined present from my whole family. And the Nintendo 64 was my best friend for a long time. I played a lot of Super Mario, a lot of Mario Kart, a lot of Smash Brothers. Um, I never played any of the shooters, but uh, Kirby, Crystal Shards, I loved that game. Uh, so games have always kind of been a really big uh, part of my life. I never thought I would work in the game industry, but when the opportunity arose, I was very quick to, of course, say yes. And uh, the biggest reason why I'm here today is because I am almost completely blind. Uh, I have about 2% of what is considered to be normal vision. Uh, this gene, actually, these two genes that I have um, are in 80% of people who are born with cataracts, which I was. And they run in my family. So my father is also blind, my brother is blind, uh, my grandmother was blind, and this genetic mutation goes back about 500 years or so to um, a small group of people in Italy who had contracted the measles back then. And the mutation has stayed uh, with them. So sidebar, vaccinate your kids. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to first talk about was a little bit about myths related to uh, blindness and blind people. Because oftentimes when I tell someone first that I can't see, they don't believe me right away, or they believe me but they don't understand, or they hear about me and then they see me and they're confused. Um, I think a lot of people, when they hear a blind person, they think of Stevie Wonder or Ray Charles or someone who's famously blind, who has the thick glasses and the cane and some kind of visual, physical reminder, or they think of an old person. They don't think of fashionable, young, millennial woman. Um, which is a bit unfortunate because blind people come in pretty much every shape, size, color, and age that you can imagine. Um, there really is no, there is no uh, kind of set really boundary of what a blind person can be. Uh, but when we talk about age-related blindness, which of course is a common thing, uh, that can start as early as your 40s. You can get an age-related cataract as early as age 40. And uh, you can, of course, get that removed, but there's no guarantee that you will have exactly the same vision as you had uh, before you had that cataract and then after you have it removed. Um, so it's something to consider that your sight is never really guaranteed. Uh, there are also other form forms of ocular degeneration that can affect people of any age. Uh, as Ian said before, you can go outside, fall on the ice, land the wrong way, and maybe you break your arm, or maybe something gets into your eye, and that's it. 
I mean, it'll never be the same. So every second that you have that you can see quote unquote normally is, is, is something that you should really cherish, but also something that you should consider is special for you because not all of us can experience that. And I have to check my notes again. And yeah, regarding the elder, elderly people, as Ian also pointed out earlier, none of you seem to indicate that you are going to stop gaming once you are older. So older people definitely play games. Uh, if you are at all familiar with, you know, those Facebook browser games that people play like Gardenscapes or uh, what was the other one with the farm, Farmville? I mean, a lot of that demographic was actually women in their 40s and older who were playing. Um, and, you know, they had, of course, their own different challenges. And some people have very strong opinions that those are not games, they're toys, but they're games. Like it or not, they're games and people play them. So it's something that you need to consider, I would say. Now, talking a bit about my childhood, um, I come from a very large Catholic family. So I had lots of cousins, lots of people around me, and everyone had consoles. Some people had Sega, some had PlayStation, some had Nintendo, some had all of them. <laughs> and some had just PC at the time. And I was always interested in the games. I always wanted to play them. I always wanted to be with my cousins and, and playing with them. But it wasn't always allowed. Quite often, I had to wait uh, for my cousins to finish playing. And then I would get the chance to play with my other cousin uh, who has severe mental handicaps. So usually it was Edward and I playing together because Edward also uh, couldn't play normally, which some of my cousins didn't have patience for. Uh, so usually it was just him and I playing together and I would be sitting kind of like this next to the screen and he would be a little bit farther back, but he was patient. Um, so he didn't mind that I was kind of sitting in front of the screen and we'd play together. But oftentimes if Edward wasn't around or if he was doing something else, I played alone and I played later. Uh, so that's why uh, this kind of topic is, is, is personal for me, especially when we talk about uh, games that kids might be playing because I remember that loneliness and I remember that feeling of like, man, like I just want to play like them and I want to play with them. Why don't they want to play with me? Uh, and as I got older, it became less of an issue. Some of my friends started to mind uh, less when I got into school a bit, like, okay, you have to play that way, that, that's fine. It doesn't bother my sight that much. And if it was like a multiplayer game where the screen would be divided into four, like Mario Kart 64, usually I would uh, pick the controller that I would know would be in the bottom corner so that I could be in the bottom corner and I wouldn't be obstructing uh, the view for anyone else. But it was a lot of things that I had to consider um, that other kids didn't have to. And uh, now there's so much technology out there, but there's still not as much as there could be. Uh, but now being blind and a child and a gamer would be much easier than it was, I would, or was, I would say 20 years ago. But there's still a, a very long way to go, in my opinion. I'm learning all the time about these new things. I'm still more, more of a retro gamer just because uh, I don't have that much time to play newer games. But I play a lot of Nintendo 64 still. Um, I also play a little bit of mobile gaming or mobile games, and I've tried a bit with PC games, um, but a lot of them are still inaccessible to me. We were just talking with Ian earlier about Hearthstone. All my friends play it. I'm not exaggerating. All of my friends play Hearthstone and I can't, uh, but I'd like to, <laughs> but there's nothing that reads the cards to me. So it's, it's out, it's, it's, that, that's it. It's not an option. Um, and this is kind of something that I kind of want to emphasize as well when you think about making games for disabled people. That should not be your focus. Your focus shouldn't be, I'm gonna make this really great indie game that 10 blind people are going to play. What it should be is thinking about a game that you've had an idea about and how to make that game that so, yeah, sorry, how to make it so that game is be able to be played by anyone um, and thinking about it from the very beginning. Because even me and my studio, uh, our first game is very difficult for me to play, which is embarrassing because I can't demo it to anyone because I can't play it on my phone. It's sad, but it's true. And uh, it's, it's mostly because I didn't speak up earlier in the process when we were developing it to say, hey, you know what? This is actually really hard for me to see. Um, and now we've made some, adjustment, uh, some adjustments. We had a really big update a couple weeks ago. And uh, now that game is much easier for me to kind of navigate. But in the past, 
and before it wasn't because I was quiet for too long. So just think about it. If I am quiet, me, the actual disabled consumer, then uh, it's, it's a bit of a problem, isn't it? So what I'm hoping is that when I finish here today and you guys kind of go home and think about this, you'll be ambassadors of this kind of gospel in the sense that you'll, you'll think about it more and when you talk to your friends and other developers, you'll kind of consider it. But this has strayed away from childhood a bit, I'm sorry. But the one thing I really wanted to talk about today was uh, Pokemon Go. I love Pokemon Go so much, I spend actual money on it every month, not a lot, but a little bit. And I wrote a song about it that was number one on uh, the viral Finland list on Spotify for several weeks. Uh, and it was even used on the Finnish TV show Putos as the theme song for the character Amaryllis Yamamoto. Uh, I love Pokemon Go. I've been playing it since the day it re was released in Australia. Uh, I was waiting for it and so happy when it came and I've been playing it actively since. I'm an admin of the Pokemon Go Pori Facebook group. Um, I just love the game. But uh, the April Fool's joke, joke that they had this year made the game almost unplayable in certain aspects. So what they did was they introduced uh, pixel graphics like from the original Game Boy games. Now, I couldn't play the original Pokemon Game Boy games. I can't see a Game Boy screen. The only way I was able to play uh, Pokemon Yellow when I was a kid was by buying the um, adapter that you put into the back of the Nintendo 64 controller that allowed the Pokemon, or the, sorry, that allowed the Game Boy game to be then uh, kind of displayed on your television. And that's how I always played Pokemon Yellow, was actually on my TV. But I did play it, and I have beaten it. Thank you. But, uh, so... They introduced these pixel characters, and um, it was a bit of a shock that I couldn't turn them off. I really wanted to turn them off. The 3D sprites are much easier for me to see. Um, as you can see, like it, it's kind of hard to tell certain Pokemon apart, just because when you're talking about 8-bit graphics, you're talking about less colors and less distinction. So when I talk about my inventory, um, distinguishing stuff was really hard. I was afraid to transfer anything, or mass transfer anything. Of course, if I clicked on those individual things, I could go in and see which Pokemon it was. Uh, but since the sprites looked like that, and the font is so small, uh, there was just no real way for me to navigate my, um, navigate my Pokemon storage all that well for an entire week. Now, I had quests that I had to do that involved evolving Pokemon and transferring Pokemon, and I just had to sit on those uh, for a couple of days while this happened. And to give you an idea of how the general public <laughs> sees this problem, I actually wrote in the Silph Road subreddit um, that, hey, this is kind of annoying, and I would like to be able to uh, play the game again. Uh, is anyone else having this problem? And of the 20 replies that that thread got, only one of the replies was, wow, I didn't think of that. You should write to Neemtik and tell them that this is a problem for you and that you're struggling. And, and, and they clearly didn't think about this. Is there a problem? Yeah, it's just a little bit connected. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, they clearly didn't think about this. You should write to them. The rest of the 19 replies were something like, just wait for it. Yeah, I can't see it either. Sucks, man. So the idea wasn't even that, okay, wow, I didn't think of that. That's unfortunate. Only one person actually had the foresight to think that this is a bigger problem. Everyone else was just like, wow, whatever. <laughs> and that's kind of how I've always felt the attitude toward accessibility was up until recently. I always kind of joke to myself that, some important game person will have to hurt themselves tragically and it'll be horrible, but only then will things change because then someone who the people see as someone who matters will be affected and then things will change. I'm glad that I'm wrong in that things have kind of progressed, but not being able to play my favorite mobile game for a couple of days um, in the way I would want to was really unfortunate. Um, and yeah, it was just, just a simple thing. The 3D sprites didn't go anywhere so it would have been almost no effort at all for an EMTIC to add some kind of button that would have let me just switch back to the 3D sprites. But no, I had to wait. So now they're back to normal. Now I can play the game normally and I've caught up on my quests. But when all of my friends have Mew already and I don't, 
because that's what you get for completing those quests. You get Mew, which is like a legendary, powerful, important Pokemon. All my friends but me have it, and I have to work now over time just so I can be at the same level as the other people in my raid group and the other people who I, I, I normally play the game with. And that's something that could have been easily avoided if they would have just thought about it. Um, like I said, I'm not really sure how well you guys understand this, but like, if you look at uh, this image, I cannot tell the difference between Ponyta and Rapidash at all. I'm sure you guys might be able to, but I can't. And same thing with coughing and wheezing. It's really hard for me to distinguish which is which. And here's just another example of what I was talking about. Everything just looks so similar. Like if you look at that and that, they look so similar to me that I was just afraid to touch anything because I didn't want to transfer anything that I wasn't supposed to transfer because when you transfer a Pokemon in Pokemon Go, it's gone forever. So. so, in closing, I think the most important thing that I want you guys to take away from my little rant here is uh, that you should not be afraid to ask questions. Uh, you should not be afraid to Google uh, or search on YouTube for gamers with various disabilities. Reach out to them. Ask them not how you can make a special game for them, because that is absolutely not what most of us want, but rather how to make games that everyone else is playing uh, accessible to us so that we can play with our friends. Because it's, it's not gonna go anywhere for you when thinking about accessibility if you just sit around in a room full of healthy men or healthy women, and that's your team, is just people with no disabilities making decisions on our behalf. You need us involved in the process because otherwise you'll never know what actually needs to happen. You can't know for us unless you're in our shoes. So diversity in the team who's developing, people with different disabilities, people with different kind of experiences working with the disabled, that's really important. And they need to be heard and you need to talk to them and ask them what kind of struggles they're having, what they want, whether they're deaf or blind or uh, mentally handicapped in some way. It's just, it's so essential and it's so basic. You know, when you think about it from the very beginning of the development process, it doesn't cost you anything, maybe an extra day or two um, if you're doing it in the beginning. But when you think about it at the end of the project, you've already got an almost finished game. <laughs> and then, only then do you think, oh, we need to do this. And then you've got to go back and it just takes weeks or months for something that could have taken just a couple of days if you would have thought about it in the beginning. And if you would have involved, or involved disabled people in some way in, uh, in the development process from day one, you would have had a much faster time, a much easier time, and a much cheaper time. And oftentimes, budget is sort of everything. So, I mean, why not? Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, you might be healthy now, but anything can change. I learned that last year. Um, when I started developing chronic migraines and chronic muscle tension uh, as a result of how I have to kind of wrench my neck to use my phone and use a computer. I never had any chronic pain before that, but now I do. And it has made me think about how I sit when I use the computer and how I sit when I want to watch TV and how I sit when I want to play a game. And I've got to think now a lot about that on top of, uh, on top of you know, focusing to see to play. And a lot of that wrenching that I do could be kind of reduced or could have been reduced if the technology would be better so that I didn't have to think so much about even seeing what I was doing. And uh, that type of thing, of course, is unique to people who have to wrench their necks a lot to see. But as I said before, and as Ian said, it could happen to anyone at any time. Nothing in this life is guaranteed. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to make you understand that you know, right now it might seem like disabled people are this group that you are not a part of, but there's nothing stopping you from being part of the group. And even if it's just temporary, you break your hand, you have to be in a wheelchair for a couple of weeks for whatever reason, you're not going to want to stop playing games during that time. Of course you're not. You're going to be maybe a bit down that you're having that inconvenience, and maybe games are going to be the one thing that you want to do to make you happy. Uh, so the last thing you want is to be excluded during that time period. So 
if for no other reason, think about how you yourself would feel. Don't think about me. You could think I'm an idiot. I don't care. But think about yourself and what you would want in my position. Um, and otherwise, I don't really have much else to say. This went much faster than I thought it would. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to come up? Do you want to sit down? Yeah. OK. Well, I can stand. All right. Well, we can, we can or I can sit too. Fine. One more. Okay, I'll, I'll take a chair too. I can sit too then. All right, time for questions. Okay. Um, yeah, spontaneous panel, I think, with, yeah. with the chairs. So um, if audience has any questions, there is a throw mic uh, that is thrown to you. So use that and wait for a while. Uh, but while you think about the questions, maybe we'll, we'll move to a couple of them. So I think one of the most important thing is to kind of highlight what is the best source for anybody to check for what kind of design guidelines there could be for different disabilities. Um, yeah, well, the, the Game Accessibility Guidelines um, site that I put up there. Um, there's all kinds of other nice resources if you're looking for something more specific, like if you want specific advice on accessibility in VR or accessibility in mobile games, there's good stuff, um, stuff uh, written out there as well. Um, but there's, there's basically three sources of information. Um, you have um, accessibility guidelines, um, which are great because they're free and you can look at them at any point in development. Um, but they're not specific to your game. They take a bit of interpretation. Um, there's also um, getting expert advice. Um, there's also working directly with people with disabilities as well. So like each one of those things kind of has their own pros and cons, but the more of them you can layer up, the, the, the closer you can get to making sure as many people as possible have a good time with your game. And I think that's, that's an important thing to talk about is actually how to, um, how to get people with disabilities involved. That's the question that's, that's often asked. And that's one of the questions that was asked in, in the thing as well, was, was how, how do you do that? How do you find people? Um, and you said just, just Google people, right? People yeah, I mean, YouTube. YouTube is full of people like me. You know, I have my channel. It's not as active as it should be, but I have mine. And a lot of my commenters are other blind people saying, hey, I also have this channel. Um, check it out. So, I mean, just type in on YouTube, like, blind gamer or deaf gamer or something and, and, and whatever disability you're trying to account for and then the word gamer into YouTube and you'll find all kinds of channels and all kinds of people with all kinds of ideas and uh, experiences. So it's, it, we're out there. You just have to search. It's, it's a simple search and you'll find it. Yeah, and st like Twitch streamers and people on Twitter and, and st all kinds of social media sources finding people. Real world as well. Um, just any decent sized city like Helsinki will have a ton of disability organizations and disability community groups as well. Um, the, and if, if you contact some kind of community group, then, then people are usually pretty keen to have their voices heard. That's very nice. We've also had on this series, we had a, a lecture on influencers. So is there some famous uh, kind of a barrier people that would help you to also spread the voice to the gamer community of disabilities of your game? Like, c could we reach for also YouTubers to play the game like in the, you yeah, know, without yeah, disabilities? Yeah, yeah. yeah YouTube, YouTubers, Twitch streamers, um, there's, there's some really, really prominent um, people with disabilities um, who are... Any famous persons? Um, sh oh, at the top of my head, um, Half Coordinated. Has anyone come across Half Coordinated? Um, yep, he, Half Coordinated is a um, speedrunner. So he does um, uh, games done quick, um, events, that kind of stuff. And um, as his name suggests, um, he has one functional hand. So he does it all one-handed. Um, he's he's um, very well known. Um, others... Um, Maybe Lisa Pren? <laughs> yeah, I mean, according to Ule, I am an internet sensation. So it's not often you get that title, I guess. But no, I, I wish I would be considered an influencer, but I'm not. But you can no. still you could send games for you to play. Would you like that? Yeah, I've I've actually been thinking about starting. A, well, I have I've made the website. I just haven't launched it yet. A, a consultation business for apps, games, and also physical spaces, where I kind of give a little bit of advice about how things can. Uh, how things can be made better, at least for people who can't see. And I, of course, try to consider also other uh, impairments since one of my best friends is a little person uh, with very limited kind of hand coordination and, of course, trouble moving. So I try to think about her as well when I uh, 
give accessibility consultations and things like that. But yeah, by all means, if you want to send me your games, I will play them. And if you want to pay me to do that, that's even better. <laughs> and you've got another 30, 40 subscribers here, right? Yeah, exactly. <coughs> yeah. The yeah, others like um, Def, Def Gamers TV, um, Cherry Ray. Um, but it, you often find, if you, if you just find one person, um, you'll often find exactly like, um, like you're saying about other people commenting, but also people following and like sharing channels and that kind of stuff. It's quite easy to like follow the network out and find other people as well. And a lot of times, a lot of times people are pretty uh, quiet about it. Like this is a completely different industry, but I used to work in music and uh, one of the biggest punk rock record labels in the US, uh, Hopeless Records, is ran by a guy with even less vision than I have. Um, he's almost totally blind at this point. It's gotten worse over time, so now he basically can tell if it's light out, and that's about it. Uh, and he uses screen readers and everything like that, and he's an absolute legend in the music industry. And a lot of people have no idea that he can't see. Um, so a lot of times, uh, people aren't so open, I think, about the fact that they might have a problem. And with the internet, I used to not really talk about the fact that I couldn't see either until I realized that there were people like you and uh, other kind of event organizers who actually were trying to help my cause. Before that, I was afraid to actually talk about being disabled online because people on the internet suck. So, I mean, you know, you can be anything you want on the internet, but for some reason, a lot of people choose to be jerks. So, uh, I've always kind of sort of been reserved about it up until about maybe two or three years ago. Yeah, I think that's been really nice to see the changing, the changing attitudes that there've been amongst gamers. So especially, yeah, if you went back like five, seven years ago, like if, if someone was posting on a forum for a game saying like I'm experiencing an accessibility issue in a game, exactly the same with posting it in the, on the Silk Road subreddit, right? Yeah. Um, it would be met with nothing but vitriol. Um, but I th think over the past few years for all kinds of reasons, but I think part of it is just exposure people, gamers starting to see accessibility features in games and realizing that actually, no, this isn't some scary thing that's gonna come in and dilute our experiences down to a lowest common denominator and all that kind of stuff. Like, allaying some people's fears. And, and now, the, the majority of, like, there's certain communities for certain games which are still quite toxic, but the vast majority of the time when somebody posts about an accessibility issue, it's an outpouring of support. Other gamers saying, like, that, like I, I, I feel uncomfortable. Yeah, that's a turning point for me, actually, was mm. Assassin's Creed, that was the first time I noticed like the support outweighing um, the um, anti. And I saw, I remember a, a, a quote that really stood out for me was a gamer saying, um, it was somebody was requesting remapping because they can't physically reach the buttons. They didn't get the remapping, but the reaction from the community, I saw someone saying, like, I, I, I have never thought about this before. I've never thought access about accessibility, but I don't think I can comfortably play the game now thinking that I'm enjoying this experience and knowing that there's another gamer there who should be a gamer, should be enjoying it, who's just been locked out of the experience. So was, that was quite a turning point, that game. And it's just continued and continued. And it's really nice to see that, that growing acceptance and understanding and that real wish from gamers for, for more people to enjoy the same experiences that they're experiencing as well. So, I mean, it's not there yet. There's been a lot of progress there. And it kind of, it's the kind of thing that gives you a bit of hope for, um, for communities in general, that hopefully those kind of attitudes of acceptance could spread out to other areas as well. I think the thing for me that was a really big turning point actually had nothing to do with uh, video games, but actually hockey. I had posted in the hockey subreddit uh, just about how I watch Red Wings games, because my Red Wings are everything to me, and I hate the fact that we're not in the playoffs. And um, I just kind of shared a video there about, yeah, so this is how a blind person watches hockey at home. Uh, and this was right before the NHL had redesigned uh, Game Center and made it just an awful platform. Uh, so I had made that video and a lot of people were commenting on that, saying exactly what Ian had just said relating to Assassin's Creed, that I never realized that uh, people go through so much effort to do something that I just thought was something so basic, you know, as, as, as just turning on the television and watching, watching a hockey game. Um, and the discussion turned into one of the most upvoted uh, our hockey posts of the whole year that I posted it, which was 2015, I think. Uh, so uh, after I posted that video and I got so much support from people and encouragement from people, I was much more open, I would say, online about uh, issues related to accessibility and issues related to me living my daily life, whether it be playing a video game or walking around. Um, I'm actually at some point supposed to be on Ule again. We filmed it, it's all ready. I just don't know when it's going to air. I had a reporter follow me around Pori for a whole day last week. 
For Pokemon Go? Uh, no, just for walking. But I was playing Pokemon Go the whole time. <laughs> So that's definitely there. Yeah. I'm not going to waste all those valuable times like walking on the street, not hatching eggs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I don't know when that's going to air. But I mean, it affects every aspect of your life. And games are supposed to be a kind of a place where we can, we being anyone, not just disabled people, can relax and kind of immerse ourselves and forget about this crappy world that we're in for a little while. So if it's even hard to do that, then it's like, what's the point, you know? But it, it, it seems like for, for me, as an illiterate, for, for this topic, that the things are very easy to do. Like the, to provide the subtitles in different formats, for instance. They are, but no one thinks about it. And yeah. then sometimes people also have, uh, this is one attitude I've run into in Finland. I'm not going to name names, but I've had Finnish game devs say to me that, uh, well, if we start customizing for one person, we've got to do it for everyone. And to which I replied, well, yeah, but if I can play it, then or if we can play it, then so can other people. Adding, just being able to customize stuff makes the world a difference. So it's not adjusting for everyone. It's not going out and finding every medical condition in the world and asking, okay, how does this impact how you hold a controller? But rather just thinking about really simple stuff in the very beginning of the development process. And that makes a world of difference. Yeah, it al already also expands the, 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 uh, the community that you're reaching with your game. So it, is, it should be a serious issue. It looks good for PR. I mean, think about all, no, really. Like, think about all the attention Apple got a couple weeks ago when they said they were going to have handicapped emojis. I mean, that news article was everywhere. All the associations who work with the disabled were sharing it. And it's like, it's like nothing. There's actually a half as interesting video about how to um, make an emoji. And there's a whole committee that decides which emojis get made and which don't. It's absolutely fascinating. I highly recommend it. But, uh, and you can submit them. Yeah, you can submit them. There's a you, form to submit your Yeah, there's a whole, emojis. and then there's it's an application process. It's, it's great, actually. But such a simple, tiny thing, emojis with disabilities. And the article was viral. So think about all the attention Apple got just for doing something so simple. So imagine if you can say that, yeah, we're a studio that takes you know, accessibility into into consideration, I can already see the stupid clickbait headline, like brave Finnish college students standing up for people with disabilities. Number five will shock you. <laughs> <laughs> but you saw some of the examples in, in the games that I had up of, like those, those weren't screenshots of games, those were screenshots of articles that were being written about the features. Um, there's one of them in particular, if, do you remember Hue, which was that color-based puzzle platformer um, that had the symbol language on there? So basically, how, how the games works is, is you um, have that color wheel, and when you choose one of those colors, that changes the background of the game. And any foreground objects that were the same color as the background object that you've chosen then disappear, like you can walk through them and stuff. So you can kind of see how they make the puzzles and stuff. Um, but yeah, they just added those symbols on, and they put in their um, press kit, and actually this is another good separate point that you really need to tell people about what features you've got in your game. The worst thing that can happen is you put effort into making these things and people don't discover them. That's happened in a few games. So really, really make sure you tell people. They just put a single bullet point in their um, press kit saying, um, we have a colorblind mode. That's all they did. And um, that got picked up on, because it's an inherently color-based game, that got picked up on a lot in their reviews. In particular, on uh, Metacritic, their top 10 reviews on Metacritic Every single one of those top 10 had included praise for the colorblind mode in the review. The very top review, like on Metacritic, the, the number one top review shows a quote from the review. That quote was actually about their colorblind mode. And Hugh um, got overall green on Metacritic. And obviously, like the difference between green on orange and Metacritic makes a big difference commercially to how much of a financial success your game is. They made it into green by one point. So if they hadn't have put that one single bullet point in the game, you know, that's, that's what all it took to make a real financial difference from that press coverage as well. So there is a business uh, opportunity to take, and uh, while you do that, you learn it, and then next games, when maybe it's not that rare anymore, it's just so easy for you to make that consideration in the design. So now it's the right time to really look at these issues, I think. Yes, there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that, like, people our age and older are starting to have kids, and those kids are starting to be born with disabilities or born with, uh, f or have friends who are disabled. Like I think as we get older, we're kind of meeting more people, and that kind of exposure to it 
you know, because I can't see, hands up, but uh, maybe someone can tell me, hands up, how many of you before today have actually interacted with someone who you knew was blind? Is anyone raising their hands? About 10. All right. About 10, yeah. How many are here? How many? About 30, 40. Uh, okay, so it's not... It's this going, about, like, about a quarter? Yeah, so th that means, what, 75% of the people in this room haven't even met a blind person before. Yeah. So it's like, you know... It's hard to make this stuff without, without knowing. Without the awareness. Yeah, without the, the awareness. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. I just thought of something. Um, you are actually wrong. Um, Am about, I? about being wrong. Oh. Because because <laughs> <laughs> you were saying because you were saying about how it would it would take um, somebody in a significant um, position in the industry to have issues affecting them mm -hmm. um, to make a difference. Um, not just Xbox, but Microsoft in general have been making a huge difference in accessibility. Um, they've even changed Microsoft's entire mission statement to be about enabling everyone on the planet um, to be able to have good experiences. It's not the exact words, but it's something along those lines. Um, so yeah, the whole corporate culture has changed fundamentally, and that's made a massive difference to everything, including Xbox. And that's because they got a new person at the top um, called Satya Nadella. He's the um, top guy at Microsoft now. And um, his son has cerebral palsy. So he has personally invested, and that has made a massive difference. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. If it would just be me shouting into the wind, first it would be, shut up, woman, and then it would be, you know, oh, you're blind. <laughs> is there any questions from the audience? <laughs> there is one. Uh, there's two questions. Three questions. So wait for the throw mic to come to you. Don't get hurt with the throw yeah, mic. Don't. The, the yeah, concept don't. of throw mic scares me. There's <laughs> all sorts of uh, possibilities that see. might happen with throwing <laughs> objects. As someone who can't see, the concept of a throw mic is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you hear me from your... I don't... If it's not on, I'll just bring my mic to you. Is it on? Okay. Try putting it really yeah. close to your mouth. Right. Sometimes they basically need to be in your mouth <laughs> yeah, to work. Right. All right, yeah. it, it, it is working. Yeah. 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 Well, first of all, I just wanted to, well, thank you both. It was very interesting to listen to you. And then second, to tell a sort of an anecdote about myself and an accessibility feature that I didn't realize how it would have affect my life. It was about actually what reminded you because you brought up the smart steering in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and it was like really wonderful for me when I realized that, that this means that I can hand a controller over to my three-year-old daughter and play the game with her. Like, she will have fun playing it because the game will just steer for her. And it's like, it's a really great feeling when your daughter comes to you and saying, Dad, I want to play Martikati with you. Martikati. <laughs> 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 yeah, and well, the question I had was also regarding Nintendo Switch because it now has this, what they are, have dubbed the HD Rumble method and you brought up that one example about the game using sort of rumble as a haptic feedback do you think that that hd rumble will be sort of will it bring some new options to the table as compared to regular rumble and do you think people are actually going to use it for accessibility features absolutely yeah so that's the question if the if the more detailed rumble on the switch could be used for accessibility absolutely it could be um well i, I get yeah an example of that is um what was it called there was a, um, a game that came out at launch. It should really have been bundled with it. I can't remember what it was called. Zelda? No, no, no. no it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was like a mini game kind of thing where it was all done through the um, HD Rumble. One, two, switch. Yes, yeah. one, two, switch. That's what I mean. One, two, switch technically should have been bundled with a console. But that's a whole different conversation. Um, but yeah, one, two, switch. Um, there, there was people who are completely blind, no vision at all, um, who were overjoyed at being able to, to buy the console and have that game and play stuff. Not just playing games, but playing games socially on an equal basis with other people because it was all based on that. Um, so it's got, it's got huge potential, I'll, I'll say that much. Um, there, there haven't been haven't been huge applications of it yet, and I think often it's, it's difficult when you see these kind, of, these kind of new technologies that come along when they are, um, I guess, the same with things like Connect and even touchscreens when they came out, where it's seen as like a new toy to be used on its own. But any kind of new technology, as well as offering new possibilities, also throws up disadvantages as well. Um, so I have a very, very minor um, accessibility issue in that um, I have RSI, so I can't play with any kind of hack to haptics in my right hand. Um, and there's only ever been one game that that was affected by. It was Costume Quest, uh, Costume Quest 2 on the Xbox. And the Xbox One, for some reason, 
it's now fixed. But when it launched, they forgot to include the option to turn off Rumble at system level. And I love the first costume quest, but I couldn't play costume quest two because it had Rumble. Um, that's, that's um, anyway, uh, <laughs> slight rant slash tangent. Um, but that's the thing, so stuff, stuff like the haptics, when, um, and any kind of new technology, where it becomes really, really powerful is when it's used as an option. So basically, if you use that, that's, if that's layered up with um, different options of how to interact, that's when it becomes really, really powerful. I actually have a Switch. Um, this is kind of embarrassing. I bought it the day it came out, thinking that I was going to play Switch, and then I've had absolutely no time to really invest much effort into it uh, in the past year and one month since it's been out. I have Mario Odyssey and I have Breath of the Wild, but uh, Breath of the Wild I kind of started to play, but it was just too hard to see. Uh, Mario Odyssey, a bit easier to see, but still kind of problematic, but I just need more time before I can actually properly assess those games. There were more questions, so maybe you throw the mic to the closest person, that, that's good. Oh, while the mic's being thrown, actually on a similar note to what you were saying, there's a really, really nice video of somebody using Copilot on the Xbox to play Minecraft with their daughter, who I think is like about two or three. It's an amazing video. She's in fits of hysterics. Basically, all she's got is the button to open and close the door. So he's <laughs> like doing the walking, and she's just there opening and closing the door. The amount of joy that she's <laughs> getting from just opening and closing that door. And that's the thing. I think it's always useful to, to kind of step outside of what your ideas of what the fun of a game is, because there's all kinds of different types of enjoyment people can get out of experiences. OK, please. Thank you. This is a question I can Google, but I thought I would ask you too. Recently, I've been thinking of designing a game without any visual user interface, not for any accessibility reason, but just because I'm tired of watching screens all day, every day. And I was wondering if you have played any such games and did you enjoy playing them? Like auditive games. Yeah, audio games. Yeah, yeah, mostly based on auditory feedback. Do you want to go first? I haven't at all played any audio games. I'm like the worst blind person ever. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, in that case, yeah, there, are, there is a whole community around um, audio games. Um, if you go on a website called audiogames.net, um, if you go in the forums there, um, it's, it's all um, blind gamers there. Um, but a lot of people who've got a lot of experience at developing audio games as well as playing audio games. So that's a really, really good resource. Um, especially there's, there's some kind of assumptions people make and like initial ideas about what might, wait, what might work well that aren't always correct, um, but they'll be very, very happy to chat to you about ideas. And obviously what works for somebody who's blind also works for, with somebody who um, is jogging, for example. Yeah. There was mm -hmm. a nice example of, oh, what was it called? Uh, zombie, zombies Run? Which it zombie was like run, a yeah. zombie run, yeah, yeah. Um, so they actually so they actually made that game um, blind accessible. Um, not so much useful if like you are have got no vision at all, encouraging you to jog around the streets. It wasn't about. I that. do it all the time. You have you have you have some vision though, right? Uh, a little bit. I still shouldn't be walking freely as much as I do, but. Yeah. But that's there are a lot of people who are using it not not actually for like jogging around streets and following the map, but playing just playing it at home. And with all the, the blind accessible um, uh, base building stuff they had in it as well. So they kind of were starting off thinking about um, from the other way. Uh, well, the same way you're thinking about it, right? Thinking about a use case for developing a game that didn't have any, that wasn't reliant on visuals, then getting interest from blind gamers and developing the interface to make sure it worked for them as well. Um, Alicia, have you played the Johann Sebastian Joust, GS Joust? No, I've heard about that. I think someone suggested that to me, but I, I haven't. Usually, if, if, if anyone talks about like audio stuff, um, and I actually have time to listen to something and I don't want to look at anything, usually I'm listening to audiobooks, actually. I'm really big on audiobooks. I, I don't know why I never crossed over into audio games, but audiobooks I'm really big on. Well, me too. I, I still see. So it's yeah. just not to have that much uh, screen time, as, That's as exactly uh, it. she was referring to. Yeah. So it's good. Like Copenhagen Game Collective uh, has been building games to, and others as well, to to kind of uh, take us away from the screen and doing other things also with the digital technology. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, Dave Dave Grossman, who was um, he worked on the original uh, Monkey Island games, and then I think he may be an account co-founder of Telltale. Um, but yeah, he left Telltale a few years ago to work specifically on that, on like interactive um, radio dramas without any visuals. Right. And so I guess from his side, it would have been about the kind of like the storytelling potential and stuff from it. Yeah. I'm guessing. But yeah. 
but yeah, definitely the audio games forums would be good to check out um, for the interaction as well. So like all the people in there have, that's their entire experience of games is figuring out different interaction methods that work nicely without having any visuals. So they'd be really, really good people to chat with. Thank you. And then to the next person. Oh, we can, nobody's throwing anything. Oh, that's so nice. Hello, so one of the first things that popped in, into my mind when I was uh, here is uh, like I've really enjoyed playing virtual real reality games in the autonomous is the, get the center. And I was just wondering like how do you feel about like the virtual reality games? How, like, how do they uh, take on disabilities? Like, and like is there because like it's very much still being formed, like all the control schemes and everything. So, so what are they? Are they doing something okay, or, or how do, could they improve and stuff like that? We have to see if much around with the Gear VR before, right? Uh, yeah, I, I have a Gear. I got it for free uh, with my last phone, and uh, at the time there were a couple of experiences that were available for free that you could try um, in the gear shop so there was like a pokemon experience and a hockey experience so two of my favorite things um and what i found was that i was still blind in vr world uh so i mean things were still far away if that makes any sense like uh i didn't i didn't feel empowered i, I actually get asked about vr quite often and i i feel like i'm always kind of disappointing people when i tell them but it it just didn't this was a year and a half ago, so of course, like since then, quite a lot of things could have changed. But uh, there was one thing where you could like be in the press pit for the Philadelphia Flyers, so you could watch the cameramen kind of set up their cameras and watch the uh, the team warm up a bit on their end of the ice. And I mean, I maybe had a little bit more clarity than if I physically would have been in the press pit. Uh, but what limited me was I couldn't zoom in on anything like I couldn't focus like more specifically like I had 360 video but I couldn't zoom in whereas if I would be at a Flyers game physically at the arena I could take out my camera and I could zoom in if I wanted to watch the goalie and just watch what the goalie was doing I could just zoom in with my camera uh, and that's something I couldn't do in, in VR with with that experience so uh, I went to at women in games we had one meetup at the remedy offices um, like a year and a half ago as well and uh, they had a Vive, or whatever it's called, the uh, HTC thing. And uh, I basically just pet the dog the whole time that they have in there. It was like an office sim, and there was a little puppy. Basically, it was just rubbing the puppy's belly, because I really couldn't see much else. So. I think, actually, even just um, well, from the way that you're interacting with the laptop, that is a perfect use case for why you should allow people to lean in closer to your interfaces in VR. Because mm. like some interfaces do allow you to lean closer, other ones they're like locked at a fixed distance away from you. Um, but I think in terms of uh, vision, at, at least um, something that there is a big potential with in VR is um, having the head tracked binaural audio. Um, that kind of stuff, particularly for people who've got no vision at all who are it's a bit frustrating because I see people who've, who've literally got no vision at all who won't even try VR because they think solely it is like a thing that you strap onto your eyes, so therefore it's just about visuals. Um, but if you're someone who relies on sound exclusively anyway, um, being able to play a sound-based experience that actually tracks with your head movements the same way as the visuals do, I think could, could have some really nice potential. I would actually use that. I would really use that. Um, but yeah, so the, I think like um, as as we're saying with the haptics and stuff, that, that any kinds of new technology like that has all kinds of um, opens up all kinds of new possibilities. So, for example, someone who can't physically look around using a stick, being able to look around using your head might be a huge enabler. Um, on the other hand, you might have someone who just the physical act of putting on a headset is just not physically possible. So it kind of opens and closes doors at the same time. So uh, hopefully the tech will improve so that some of those currently unavoidable barriers will become avoidable through the design of technology. Um, but in terms of the actual design of the software itself, there is a lot that you can do. And it comes down to those, those same kind of principles um, of communicating information in more than one way, offering people some flexibility, um, some flexibility in controlled methods um, in particular. So if you're talking about asking people to walk around a room 
whilst accurately moving around um, their hands and their arms. So that's, that's the combination of fine motor movement, gross motor movement and mobility. That's like a whole level of complexity that isn't normally present in games. Um, but if you, can, if you can offer some options to scale some of that back for people who need it, so that your room scale VR can still be played seated using a controller, there's still a ton of other really, really valuable stuff that people can get from that, from that immersion and stuff that it still makes it a worthwhile experience. So I think that's the key thing, I think, is getting away from kind of the auto mindset of like, here is my vision for the project, and, and actually recognizing that there's all kinds of different aspects of it that have value. So even if you offer some options for some of it to be tweaked, there's still other really, really valuable stuff in there. Um, but I, yeah, I could, I could spend a while talking about all the various different considerations um, that you could make, but a bunch of us um, chipped in together and compiled it all into, it's not as far along as like game accessibility guidelines, it's not like a list of guidelines a thing to do, it's more of thinking points. But if you just look up um, Gama Sutra VR accessibility, um, that should be first Google search result, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in there, from simulation sickness to how to design subtitles in VR to, um, um, yeah, low vision um, controller stuff, um, all kinds of things in there. So yeah, so just Google Gamma Sutra VR accessibility, that'll get you there. That's a good tip. Do we have more questions? One more? Okay, so... This has been really, really good learning process for me as well. Thank you, Ian uh, and Alicia, for sharing your experiences and expertise on the topic. And I hope that everybody has got a lot of things to kind of use in their design processes in their games. So yeah, this is Games Now. I'm Anna Kaisa Kultima, and make sure that you follow and subscribe. Also follow Alicia's channel. <laughs> yeah, in just YouTube. my name. Just my name. And, Oh, and everyone here knows about her song, right? Uh, yeah, also listen to the song in Spotify. Yeah, yeah go on Spotify, look up MC Alicia. It's there. Uh, every stream helps me put food on my table. <laughs> so a little bit ad of advertisement <laughs> to the end. So yeah, follow, subscribe, everything that you see. And um, welcome again for the next lecture. And uh, thanks for joining here in the location and also in online. Thank you.